It's now almost 12 months since President Trump came to power, and he's still adjusting to the challenges of holding the highest office in the United States. His National Security Advisor, General H.R. McMaster, has tried to guide this White House through the minefields of foreign policy. But with hotspots like North Korea and the Middle East, that's no easy task. So what are the challenges ahead? In a rare, extensive interview, he discusses this administration's policies and strategies with me. General McMaster, thank you so much uh, for doing the interview. There is a feeling internationally that this administration is withdrawing from its responsibilities as a, a leader of the world. Well, actually the opposite is the case. America is engaged in meaningful and important ways across the world. So it's the United States that is helping to lead this really global coalition to cope with the nuclear threat from North Korea unprecedented levels of sanctions and economic and diplomatic isolation to convince Kim Jong-un that he can't threaten the world with the most destructive weapons on earth. As you have described North Korea as the biggest threat to this nation and the world. And you've also said that it's our last best chance to take action before we need to take military action. What do you mean by last chance? Well, it means we're running out of time. So what this, what this regime has done over the years is develop nuclear weapons. It's a program they started back in the 1970s. And then when the international community grows more and more concerned about the provocations, whether it's a missile test or a nuclear test, oftentimes what the regime has done is they've just said, okay, we're ready to negotiate. The pressure is alleviated. They continue their nuclear programs. They continue their missile programs. They sign a weak agreement, which then they immediately break. And so after they, after they pull in all the benefits of, of the agreement, we can't do that anymore because we are out of time. I mean, their, so, their so program when you say out advanced. of time, then what line do they need to cross? Well, it's, it's really just continuing what they're doing requires us, requires the, all of us in the world to not only enforce the existing UN sanctions against the regime, but to do all we can. As the president has said, cut off trade with, with the North cut off fuel to the north. It's, it's hard to fire a missile, you know, if you don't have fuel, for example. So there are ways to, to resolve this problem short of military conflict, and we don't have a lot of time to do that. So really what we're emphasizing is this, this really campaign of, of maximum pressure to convince Kim Jong-un that what he's doing is a dead end uh, for, for him. He's and, not and, willing and to give up regime. his weapons, though. Well, certainly not as of now. That's not the case. So what it means is we have to, we have to do more. But are you committed to a peaceful resolution to this? Uh, of course, that's what we want. But we're not committed to a peaceful. We're committed to a resolution. We want the resolution to be peaceful. But as the president has said, you know, all options are on the table. And we have to, we have to be prepared if necessary to compel the denuclearization of North Korea without the cooperation of that regime. Leading Republicans uh, such as Senator Lindsey Graham have said that there's a 30% chance of war. And if they continue with these missile strikes, it could go up to 70%. Is war imminent? Well, the, the chances of war, who knows what they are. They could go up or down, I think, based on what we all decide to do. I mean, North Korea is a grave threat to all civilized people across the globe. The Russians have also said that actually they're not quite sure that the United States is committed to resolving this crisis. They've said when there was a period of calm, the United States uh, started to conduct these joint military exercises with the South. They took unilateral sanctions. They uh, described uh, North Korea as a state sponsor of terrorism. Well, this is really what's, what's funny about the behavior of some countries in the world or what they say is, is the, instead of really placing blame where it ought to be blamed on this rogue regime, you know, who has committed murder of its, of its own people, who is engaged in systematic violation of, of their rights, who has destroyed the lives of their people by creating this hell in, in North Korea. I mean, the South Korean economy, you know, is 40 times larger than the North Korean economy. There, there is no more uh, compelling example of a failed system on earth than North Korea. And I think if, if any nation or any leader then tries to blame the United States for, you know, for the threat that emanates from this, this rogue and horrible regime, it's just not credible. It's just not credible. What we, what we hope to do with Russia and with other nations is, is to, to act in our common interests. This is an area 
really where our interests, I think, completely overlap with Russia's. Russia could not be happy about a nuclear-armed North Korea, again, not only because of the direct threat it poses, but also because of the potential breakdown of that non-proliferation regime. But what about China? Because China's saying, more or less, it's saying it takes two to tango. They're saying that you can't focus on one side alone, that the United States needs to take more responsibility, bring down the rhetoric. No, no what China's saying are three fundamental things that are very important. China is saying that, this is, that North Korea is not a problem between, between the United States and North Korea. It's not a problem between, between the United States and North Korea. It's a problem for the world. It's a problem for China. Then as why well. would China impose a 100% oil embargo? Well, we think that they should take that under consideration. I mean, China will act in its own interests. And I think what you see is that China has concluded that it is in China's interest to denuclearize North Korea. And they've said so and committed to it. And that's a big change in the rhetoric of the past. I mean, there's still some, some of the, the, a tendency on the part of some people to revert back to the old language that, that, and the old approaches that failed in the past, right? That, uh, you know, we call on all parties. No, we just, we just all need to call on North Korea. North Korea would is you, the problem. I mean, but would you feel safe, uh, the, the Winter Olympics are coming up in 2018, in February, in South Korea. Would you feel safe sending your family there? Yes, we, we have, as you know, a very strong alliance uh, capability between the South Korean armed forces and our armed forces. When you extend that regionally, you know, what this crisis is doing is it's driving our allies closer and closer together with us, and, and in particular South Korea, Japan, uh, and, and the United States. Uh, this is going to be a tremendous Olympics. Uh, it, you know, South Korea is an amazing example of success. And, and, and I think it's wonderful that, that the Olympics can be celebrated there in a way that can also celebrate the great accomplishments of the South Korean people. I, and before we move on, I just wanted to ask about talks, because uh, several times the Secretary of State has said that uh, you're open to talks and the White House has pushed that back. Can you understand why the messaging is so mixed and confusing? Yeah, I, I, I do understand the, con the confusion, but there really is no confusion. It really is the Secretary of State talking about having a, a channel open uh, when, when it when the conditions are right for talks. But what the president has said and the secretary of state just clarified last week is now's not the time to talk. And what we have to do is see a, a fundamental change in behavior, a fundamental shift in conditions, because we can't afford anymore because of how far down the road they are in these capabilities to repeat the mistakes Would of the past. Would you be willing though to talk to the North Koreans, sit across the table bilaterally and hear them out? Well, under what conditions is the question? No conditions. Right? Under, 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 under what conditions? No. If there was no agenda, just come and talk. Well, I mean, that's, that's really going to be up to the president to decide. But I think what's clear now is that we cannot in any way relent on the effort to continue the isolation of the regime diplomatically and economically. What's happened in the past is North Korea has entered into talks to get the pressure relieved. And then, of course, those talks did nothing but deliver really the ability for the North to continue its programs unchecked. Let's talk about Jerusalem and the president's decision to move the U.S. embassy uh, from Tel Aviv to, to Jerusalem. Did you give him advice on the risks involved in this kind of move? Sure, we, we always do. And, and what we owe the president is, is options. And, and all of our departments and agencies work together to present options to the president, and we highlight advantages and, and disadvantages. The president makes a decision, and we implement that decision. And, and this, was, this was an important decision because it recognized, really, Jerusalem as we're the de facto um, seat of the, of the Israeli uh, government. It's where the, the prime minister lives. It's where the president lives. It's where the parliament is. And, and so, and so that, that's... That's what the president did. He did it in a way that, that stopped this process of you know, 47 waivers. He, he waived the movement of the embassy, but, but only to give us time you know, to, to, uh, but, to but, build but, an embassy in, but in Jerusalem. But General, you, you know this region. You've, you've lived in the Muslim world. You've, you've fought there. You've led men uh, into battle there. You know it's not as simple as that. But what is really, really important for everybody to understand is to go back to the president's speech and to highlight the fact that it's, he said in the speech, this doesn't change. This doesn't change the, the, the boundaries uh, or, 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 or prejudge uh, the boundaries in, in Jerusalem. And the other thing he said in the speech that seemed to get overlooked 
is that the president, if the parties agree, will support a two-state solution. And he also remains committed, committed to, to a, a peace process that, that will deliver a lasting peace. That's not how the Palestinians see it. I've spoken to Palestinian leaders. They've spoken to the BBC. They've said that any peace talks now are dead in the water. Well, uh, let's, let's hope that's not the case, right? I mean, the, a, a lasting peace hasn't proven possible up to this point under the old conditions of, of the United States not recognizing Jerusalem uh, as, as the capital. So let's see what we can, what we can, what what we can create in terms of momentum uh, under these new conditions. What the Palestinians say that it now shows that the U.S. is not a neutral uh, negotiator in all of this. Well, the, the United States is a neutral negotiator in all this. There's nothing that the United States wants more but, but it has to want it. It can't want, the United States can't want it more than, than the two parties. And so what we want to do is to, is to play a productive role uh, in, 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 in forging an agreement uh, between the parties and to get to a lasting solution. And certainly that's not how the international community see it. The Security Council has uh, voted to reverse this decision. The only uh, nation to, uh, of 15 to veto it was the United States. 14 voted for it. Right. This is a decision that the president took that, that he thought was consistent uh, with U.S. interests. And, and that also uh, it is his hope to use this decision to generate momentum in what had been a process that wasn't delivering uh, a result either for the Israeli people or for the Palestinians. Uh, some have also said that this could be used as a tool to recruit extremists. Let's just talk about uh, your fight or your calls for the fight against uh, the Islamic State. Um, you've said that we need to ensure that they don't return. Um, can you explain that a little bit more? What conditions? Sure. Well, what you need is you need enduring security by legitimate security forces that are accepted by the population. Uh, who believe that they will not prey on them, that they will not, uh, that they will not lead to a, a return to these sorts of groups. What we have seen across the greater Middle East, is, as, as you know, and, and we've all borne witness to this horror over, over the, the last uh, years and, and decades, is, is that Iran has been interacting with these Takfirin or Salafi jihadist groups in a way that is destructive uh, to the people of, of the greater Middle East. And so what has to happen is a removal of these, these drivers of, of conflict. And that, that means defeating uh, these, uh, these, these jihadist terrorist uh, organizations uh, so that they can't come back. That means denying them control of territory, populations, resources, drying up their financing, but then also defeating their, their wicked ideology to expose their, their ideology as, as, as irreligious and, and, um, and, and illegitimate. And then it also involves addressing Iran's destabilizing behavior in the region where, where Iran is, has, has really weakened governments, has, has tried to create conditions where, where governments in the region are dependent on Iran for support. This is sort of the Hezbollah model. While they grow militias outside of the government's control that can be turned against that government if it acts against Iranian interests. And so, so this is really the, the, the driver of this conflict, or, or the interaction between these, these jihadist terrorist organizations and, and Iranian-supported militias and terrorists. Do you think that um, you know, toppling or removing um, ISIS or Daesh from uh, a place like Mosul has further empowered, uh, emboldened these uh, Shia militias that are backed and funded by, by Iran? Well, Iran has engaged in a very sophisticated campaign uh, of, of political subversion uh, in, in not, only, you know, not only in Iraq, uh, but, but uh, broadly through, throughout the region. And you see what they've been doing in Yemen, which is terribly destructive as well. And they've been building this network across the region of proxy forces and militias and terrorist organizations. And they've weaponized that network uh, in, in a way that, that threatens uh, our partners uh, in the Gulf region and, and threatens Israel uh, as well. And so it's very important, I think, for us to take a, a holistic view of what Iran is doing. We ought to pull the curtain back on the behavior and actions of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps. And then all of us need to work together to, to sanction that organization, to dry up its, its funding, and to impose some costs on Iran for their destabilizing behavior. Do you see uh, Saudi Arabia as a destabilizing force in the region as well? 
Saudi Arabia, we, we think, is, is, is becoming an even more and more um, uh, important partner in the region. And there have been some very positive developments in Saudi Arabia, as you know, with calls for reform. Uh, the, the, uh, the Crown Prince's speech recently, I think, was very strong uh, on this point. Uh, the president traveled to Riyadh, as you know, very early in his presidency, and he addressed really an unprecedented group of over 50 Muslim-majority countries. And we're building, I think, amazing consensus across all of those countries and across the world on, on what we must do to, to remove the scourge of, of, of terrorism uh, from, from the earth uh, and to make sure that our children don't have to live in fear anywhere. What about actions in Yemen then, Saudi's actions in Yemen? We're talking about blockades, we're talking about airstrikes, 10,000 people dead, famine, cholera. Well, what you have to also look at is, is the actions of the Iranians and, and, and the Houthi militias that they're supporting. And, and whereas Saudi Arabia in the, in the last week, and, and all of us need to do more to address this humanitarian catastrophe in Yemen, and, and Saudi Arabia has done that this past week. Uh, we, they're lifting the blockade, uh, trying to get more humanitarian assistance in. But the problem is, once, the, once it lands in, in, southern, in southern Yemen in particular, it, how does it get to the point of need? And that's the areas that, that these Houthi militias control. So all parties need to do everything possible to alleviate human suffering and to prevent what could be an even worse catastrophe in Yemen. In particular, food and medical supplies need to get through, but also fuel, because it's the fuel that's needed to, to access, access clean water. So are you calling on Saudi Arabia to lift these blockades? Oh, we, we have called on Saudi Arabia uh, to, to, do, to do everything they can to alleviate this humanitarian crisis. The president uh, put out a strong uh, series of statements, two statements, last, uh, last week on this. And it's a grave concern to all of us. It has to be a grave concern for the world. And as you know, the United States and, and, uh, and, and many of our, our allies and partners are lead donors uh, to, to, to provide humanitarian assistance. But, but even, even the funding that we have available, it doesn't do any good if we can't get, um, if we can't get the supplies that the people need to, to, to the point of need. Uh, let's talk about uh, Russia, because you've been quite tough on Russia, actually, in the national security uh, strategy that you've laid out. And of course, all of the US intelligence community has uh, said that Russia interfered, meddled in the 2016 uh, elections. Putting the politics to one side, would you say that this is a, a national security risk and threat? Oh, certainly it is. And, and so what this national security strategy, actually we say it explicitly in the document, that this strategy views the world as it is, right? It doesn't, it doesn't create some sort of aspirational model. And so that's what we have to view Russian behavior as. For, we have to look at really what Russia is actually doing. And so what we, what we endeavor to do with Russia are really three things. Of course, we have to counter Russia's destabilizing behavior and, and, and the sophisticated campaigns of propaganda and disinformation, efforts to, to polarize communities and, and pit them against each other, especially in the, in the democratic world and in free and open societies. They use that openness and freedom against countries, I think, to weaken their popular will and, and their resolve. Uh, but we also need to prevent war with Russia, and so we, we need a, a more holistic view of deterring conflict with, with Russia. But the, and, the, but the th and building confidence with them is part of that. And, and the third thing is to find areas of cooperation. I mean, what's sad about it is in recent years, even in areas where our interests overlap, it seems as if Russia acts reflexively against us. And I mentioned North Korea. I mean, if we can't cooperate together on North Korea, what can we cooperate on? So, so I, I think that uh, we, we, uh, we're going to pursue these three tracks with, with Russia. We talk about it um, very clearly in the strategy. Uh, no, no relationship is static, right? And, and uh, remember when Ronald Reagan first came into office and he talked about the Soviet Union as the evil empire. And then once he had began to, to make some inroads, some inroads that ultimately really led to the, to the end of the, the Cold War, he was asked in an interview toward the end of his presidency, well, do you, do you still call them an evil empire? And he said, well, you know, things, things change in the world. So let's, let's well, hope well, for some you, positive Do you believe changes. that um, Russia meddled in the 2016 elections? I believe that Russia is engaged in, in, a, in a very sophisticated campaign of subversion to affect our confidence in democratic institutions, in democratic so processes, including, 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 including elections. Meddled, including well, your elections. What, the, what they used is propaganda and disinformation on both sides. They'll support very left groups. They'll support very right groups. And so what they want to do is create 
the kind of tension, the kind of vitriol that undermines our, our confidence in who we are. And when I say we, I, I talk about really any societies that have come under attack by them. So you see a similar approach in the, in the, in the Catalonia referendum in Spain, and now even in advance of the in, Mexican but, election But is this, is this something well. the president is saying as well? Yes, of course. And, and, and it, he's we, acknowledging that this kind of meddling took place? He's, he's acknowledged it publicly. So will you ensure that this doesn't happen in the future, well, this kind of interference? Yeah, to the degree that we have agency and control over it, certainly. But I think, again, one of the most important things to do is to pull the curtain back on this activity, right, and, and to expose it. Are you enjoying the job? I love the job. It's a privilege every day. I get to, to serve my country and I get to hopefully make a positive uh, difference uh, for the president uh, and to help uh, advance his agenda. It's because a lot some of, fun. of the days must get tough. No, not, not really. I don't, I don't think so. I think it's, uh, it, there are challenges, obviously, but we're, we're up for the challenges. And, and uh, one of the things the president talked about in the speech and, and a big theme uh, in, in, in the conclusion, especially of the, the highly readable national security strategy is, uh, is really the importance to, to restore strategic confidence. Confidence in who we are as a people, in our values, confidence in, in our alliances and our partnerships. And, and, and I th we're striving to do that and I think we're making progress. Do you ever have to sell a message to the American people that goes against your values? No, I mean, my, my job is to, is to state and explain policy. And, and, uh, and so I think this is, these are very bipartisan issues. These are not really uh, issues that, that uh, your politics depends. I mean, who's, is anybody for nuclear North Korea? I don't think so. You know, does, does anybody not want to, to resolve this humanitarian and political catastrophe in the greater Middle East? I don't think so. Does anybody not want to counter Iran's destabilizing behavior, restore rights to the Venezuelan people? So these are, these, these are issues we can, we can all work on together uh, across the political spectrum. Would your life be easier if the president stopped tweeting? Hey, Aristotle said, focus on what you can control and you can make a difference. <laughs> and uh, the president will do what the president wants to do. And, yes. and, uh, and it's his way of, of reaching the American people and, and, uh, and, and, and it's, it's a communication mode that is very successful for him. He has quite a number of followers around the world. And, uh, and so I, I'm, my, my job is not to, uh, to worry about, uh, about Twitter. You, you've um, come under attack from the alt-right media, from the nationalist wings within, within the, the administration as well. How do you deal with that? I think they must just misunderstand me. <laughs> In what it, does, way? it doesn't hurt my feelings. It's, no, it's okay. It's, it's, uh, you know, this, is, this is a politically charged environment these days. There are a lot of important issues to debate. Uh, debate's not bad. And so it, 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 I don't, I, you know, as long as I feel that I'm doing my best every day to serve the president and the nation, I really don't have time to worry about anything else. But you know, I, I travel right around the world and, and there really is a feeling that um, the, there's nothing like this administration, nothing like this president. And there's a real intrigue in the court, court sort of uh, politics, uh, if you will. I think the intrigue is, is, is interesting to people. But I, honestly, I've, I've not really paid attention to it. It has not affected our work on the National Security Council or our ability to serve the president. I think what you see with this national security strategy, the first time that a national security strategy has been published in the first year of a presidency, the first time where the president himself uh, rolled it out, I think it, it's a very clear, concise articulation of the, of the president's agenda in foreign policy and national security. And, and we're developing integrated strategies for our biggest challenges, some of which I've mentioned during the interview, and we're doing it with, I think, an unprecedented degree of collaboration with allies and partners around the world. General McMaster, thank you so much for thank your you time. Thank you so much. We what got a pleasure. So thank much. you. Thank you.